Welcome to How Does Your Garden Grow? I hope you enjoy this informative gardening program. Houseplants 101. The weather is getting colder and it's time to focus on our indoor houseplants. They are great at adding oxygen to the air as well as taking pollutants out. We're going to learn tips and tricks to having your plants survive a New England winter indoors. We will discuss types of houseplants, culture, watering, pruning, and overwatering tropics. And we're here in this beautiful greenhouse at Western Nurseries. So I wanted to basically start with houseplant basics today on trying to understand the needs of houseplants and basically how to replicate the same type of environment or natural native, you know, to where they would be in our homes. And that can be really difficult here in New England. We have all types of variables, air conditioning in the summer, dry heat in the winter, uh, shady lots, um, so pros and cons, but I, I do feel that it's all about picking the right plant for the right place for the right person too. Um, there's many plant enthusiasts out there that like to try some unusual types of orchids or you know other types of ferns and foliage um, and, and that's great and then there's also basic um, gardeners and, and you know beginners intermediate sort of levels so I do believe there's a right plant for a right place for the right person in, in all circumstances and um, I'd like to go over a few guidelines on um, on how to care for them and picking the right plant for you. So just basically to start, we want to talk about what is that right plant for that person? Um, what kind of light? Different, you know, plants require different amounts of light. Some require full sun, moderate light, low light, and, and that of course is going to depend on your level of exposure, sun exposure in your home. A full sun plant would want a west facing or south facing window, something that can tolerate real high light and strong sun, versus a, a medium to low light plant, you know, east facing, nice morning sun or north with nothing at all. Um, so other sources of light are fluorescent lighting also, and a lot of plants surprisingly will actually do okay with an adequate amount of fluorescent um, you know, uh, artificial lighting. So if you have an office or, you know, uh, any type like that, a cubicle that you have to sit in, uh, you can brighten up that space with some life. So we all, of course, want houseplants in the home. They, they help purify our air. They bring the outside in and, um, you know, uh, they're really trending and on the up. So, uh, Hence why we built this beautiful greenhouse in March. Um, have you all been here before? No? Welcome. So we, just a little bit of history, we have a few um, older, we call like to call them vintage glass houses over there that we have had for many, many years and we've had, um, we've grown our house plants in there and sold out of there as our retail area. And we recently built this in March because of the up and up of this uh, trend. And we've had great feedback it has its trials and tribulations for sure because you know you're working with a big greenhouse here and it's all glass and and you know here's the east and the west and trying to figure out which what the plants are really going to love in here is actually a bit of a challenge so if you you look above you you see some filtered black shade cloth we've created a shady nook back here and the front of the house has become more sun loving so just like this it's the same way in your home um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about, I want to talk mostly about issues that most people have with houseplants, commonly asked questions, and probably most, you know, the most common types of insects and so on. So any questions so far, anything anyone wants to bring up or address before I get into that? Most plants like, to, most houseplants in general like to go dry in between waterings. The number one killer that I see for houseplants is overwater. Hands down, probably nine out of 10, the, the biggest issue. So in general, I would say that plants in the home like to be watered every 10 to 14 days, give or take. And we get into here the variables, we get into the winter and you have 
things by the heater and the baseboard heating and or the vents. Um, those can certainly be big factors and dry out plants um, very quickly, and they may need to be watered maybe more seven, seven um, every seven days or so, you know, once a week. But with that, you have to take into consider where, you know, where are most of these plants grown? They're grown in the tropicals. They're grown so, you know, naturally in the tropics they don't get, you know, well in the desert they don't get tons of rain, but they have very high humidity in the tropical in the tropics. So the other thing to consider is misting our plants. Um, some plants don't care that much about it. Some do, and I'm going to kind of segue into one because it makes me think of one that really has hit the charts. <laughs> and uh, versus this is one of my picks, but I'm bringing this plant up for a reason. This is Ficus lyrata. It's a it's called fiddle leaf fig ficus. Um, it, you will see it in all the magazines, Better Homes and Garden. J. Crew sent something out last week. Thank you, J. Crew. It's a beautiful, beautiful plant with its nice, dark, glossy foliage. As gorgeous as it is, I'm not going to lie, it's difficult to have it in the home. It really likes specific conditions, and you'll see you know, many issues with it. But this, this one in particular likes humidity. So I've had three of these in my home. I've killed every one of them. I know what I'm doing, relatively, in general. Um, I've had three people in just this week with issues on the fig. It's beautiful, but this is one that likes that high humidity. This is something that you would spray once or twice a week and spritz and give it some of that humidity. You can also rest it on a pebble, on a tray of pebbles filled with water, and that would also help create that humidity for this plant. So this isn't to me, this is not a plant that would be for the um, beginner gardener, or be, you know. Um, but what I want to say, don't be discouraged. I encourage you to try. And um, you know, a lot of the young homeowners, and I don't want to say I'm young, but in my category, are not plant enthusiasts besides me. And they they love the look of this. Well, it's in J. Crew, of course. Um, so they bring it home, and and they don't have great success. And I, I just feel that it's one that needs a little bit more attention. Um, so just, again, getting to know always the right plant for the right place in the end is what I think you should focus on. So, you know, I think it would um, with the humidity in there. Also, ferns would work great in the bathroom. Air plants, have you guys experimented with air plants at all? Oh, fantastic. Um, air plants, actually, not to get too deep in it, but they actually grow on the trees in the rainforest, and they naturally just grow from the air, really. They don't need to set their roots, they, they set their roots, if you will, in, in the trees. So um, they like humidity also. So yes, in the bathroom, I think it would be worth a shot for sure. Um, definitely not a dry heat, dry uh, area. Yes? They are, yes. I didn't want to pop one up here, so I brought the tabletop size here. Um, so these also come in, as you see, this is like a multi-stem. They also come in a tree form, which there's one tucking in the corner over there. So a single trunk with a tree form. This is multi-stem. This is also multi-stem. So um, yeah, beautiful plant, but one of the trickiest. And I just bring it up because it's probably the number one top hip plant right now. Um, so with that being said, going back to, again, trying to replicate those environments in your home is um, pretty important. And the back to the watering, again, less is more. That's what, you know, the customers ask me, you know, how do, when do I water? How often do I water? Give me a schedule. You can't give a schedule. I mean, it, that's probably the number one thing to not stick to is a schedule. The number one thing to do is to feel the soil of the plant. Whether we are talking house plants, outdoor plants, uh, trees, shrubs, perennials, you've got to feel the soil. So that's where it all begins is the soil. And... What's important there, and I'm not afraid to take a little plant and just take it out of a pot and, you know, feel that soil. And, and when you feel that it's cool and moist, it's important to not water at that point. There's plenty of moisture in there. They don't need a lot to survive. Um, so with that being said, again, the number one killer is overwatering of the houseplants. Um, so soil comes into play next. Um, it's important that when growing houseplants, and depending on what you are growing,
that you start with a well-drained, dry potting soil. Um, unfortunately, in settings like this, you'll come across pallets of potting soil outside, um, and the bags are soaked, and you know, you go to repot a beautiful plant, and now you're potting in saturated soil. Well, you've already kind of started, uh, you know, to add a disadvantage with, with growing this plant when repotting or potting up whatever you're doing. So it's important to start dry. If you come across with a wet bag of soil like that, just take it out in your garage, take it wherever, cut it open, give it a few days to at least dry 50%. Um, and, I, and I think that you're working with a, a better scenario like that. Now there's obviously many different types of potting soil. There's basic uh, all-purpose potting soil. There's soil specific to cactus. Um, African violets, orchids, and I do encourage using those specific soils. A lot of them are, um, are, are obviously curtailed to those types of plants. Orchids are grown in bark. They don't even really like a, a potting a soil-based media. Um, they also are grown in moss. So I, I think that you, know, you have a one-up if you can begin with a specific type of soil. And then again, so when choosing your soil and if you want to go repot something, um, we instruct our customers to only go up about an inch to two inches inside, uh, um, two inches, I don't know, um, when moving up in your pot size. So if you were to put this size pot in a 10 inch wide pot, you're gonna have a lot of soil in there. And what a lot of soil do, it holds a lot of moisture. And all that moisture is going to cause rot. So that's why, you know, we only instruct going up about one to two inches when repotting. And, you know, too much water, rot can easily uh, be the decline of a houseplant very quickly. <clears throat> so I, I believe that, you know, light conditions, number one, you can pick your location in the home. That's number one. Number two, pick the right soil that you're looking for. Light conditions, plant soil. And so number three, um, what to look for if you're having issues. Um, there's a lot of, you know, indicators and symptoms out there that can kind of red flag you as to maybe, you know, having your plant decline. And number one, if you see anything funny going on, feel free to call the garden center. We're always here. We have a plant health desk. Any type of house plant, indoor plant um, uh, goes directly. They'll, they'll filter it right to me. Um, so as soon as you see any sort of symptoms happening, call right away um, if, you, if you don't have a good guess of what's going on. General overwatering symptoms would be um, yellowing leaves, very soft and supple yellowing leaves that, that drop. And as we all know, when plants dry out and lack of water, they also can get yellow leaves. But the way I try to remember is like, if, if you're having lack of water, something's gonna dry up. It's gonna turn more crispy. You know, so I would look for crunchy leaves if, if it's gonna be more of an underwatering condition. Most, mostly it's gonna be over watering. And then you look for that real kind of, you know, the, the leaves are waterlogged. They're saturated, they're soft, they're supple, and they just will fall off. So that's watering concerns and, and indicators I would look for. Um, the next I would think about would be any types of insect or disease concerns that you may have. So there's a lot of usual suspects that go after these house plants, these usual suspects such as mites, mealybug is another one, aphids. There's quite a few pests that favor a nice dry home. And um, you'll see when you bring your plants in sometimes from the summer into the home, so very common question to me, um, sometimes you will get an insect, uh, a pest infestation in the home. So I do recommend, as much as I don't like to treat a plant with an insecticide or any type of chemical um, before we know what the issue is, as a preventative before bringing your house plants from outside inside, uh, you know, come Columbus Day, something like that, I would consider spraying them maybe with a mild insecticidal soap, just something to kind of act as a little bit of preventative in, in, in the transitional period between bringing them out in. Now, again, going back to inside, it is favorable conditions for these little guys too to, to get at your plants. So 
There's a number of indicators and pests that you can look for. Um, number one indicator to me for a variety of pests is any type of sticky, sappy substance um, that can range in color, like it can be clear, it can be milky white, it can also be even kind of dirty black, sooty, they call it sooty mold, sooty looking. Uh, you know, so these are indicators, even though you may not see the insect up front, that's, that's what we look for here is we, we scout for it, we look for it on the plant. What would red flag me? So um, just, you know, if you notice something funny going on, again, just look for some of these things, any type of webbing. Webbing may indicate um, some spider mite issues. And, you know, if you see these bugs, I will say that um, they will hop plant to plant in general. Some plants are less susceptible than others. Um, but in general, they will hop if they find a nice menu. Um, so, you know, at that point, if you have like a collection of house plants in the home that you, you know, you're treating one of them, I might consider treating the others also as a preventative because again, although you might not see the bug, it could be present. Uh, but again, you don't want to go in armed and dangerous and start spraying helter skelter everywhere as if you have a big problem. Most, most of these insects are treatable as long as you do some regular scouting, you look at them regularly and you know, you don't let it get too far. Um, so here at the nursery, we carry a variety of products um, for insecticides and um, miticides to treat your plants with. Some are more mild than others, some are organic, some are non-organic, and so, you know, when, when, you know, we've discovered a pest, you've called, they have a pest. I love to ask my customers, please bring in a sample uh, so at least we can identify what animal we're working with and target appropriately. Um, the, you know, so, and then, you know, you may have cat, you may have cats or dogs in the home. You may have kids that want to touch things and, you know, I know my kids do and so I just throw the plant out, really. But for those who have cats and stuff that may graze, you know, just we want to be careful about what we are treating the plant with. Um, so, you know, that's basically the one-on-one on insects and, and pests, but now the whole other spiel comes on fungus and disease. So in general, houseplant diseases would include, I could probably show you some in here, <laughs> um, leaf spot. You might see browning leaf spots on the, on the plant. Um, any type of rusty, yellowish looking funkiness on the plant might be categorized as a fungus or disease. Now, that's a different animal. You don't want to use insecticide on a disease because they really need a fungicide. Um, so in that case, we do have a couple fungicides that you could recommend that are relatively safe. Some are basically copper-based. And, um, you know, fungus comes with favorable conditions. So favorable conditions, you, like in the garden outside, I don't know, do you guys have flocks, perennial flocks? Um, you might see that it gets party mildew every single year, right? No fail. So doesn't your bee balm, fine. So favorable conditions outside in New England are, generally arise in May through June when we get the real heavy rains, high humidity here in New England, poor airflow. So apply those in the home too. So, you know, it's winter. All the windows are shut. You know, you've watered. Um, any of the water sits on the leaves for a while. Well, there's no airflow in the home besides the dry heat. Um, things are staying wet for a long time because there's, again, no airflow. There's no sunshine. It's just dead of winter. And so things have a, a tendency to stay wet for a while. Um, those are favorable conditions for disease in house plants. Again, and, but it all goes back to the watering. That's really where we see the, the root of all evil is... <laughs> but, you know, a necessary uh, thing to do here. So um, it kind of all goes back to that. So less is more. You know, if, if you start to see a leaf spot, don't be alarmed. It can probably be treated with a product that we have here at the nursery, copper-based, organic, uh, friendly to use. I don't necessarily, I don't really recommend spraying any of these products in the home. I shouldn't talk because I have, 
no harm done we're fine but just you always want to make sure that you're reading the label thoroughly I was taught that in college be sure that you really go through that label um, which you'll find mostly on the back of here and if you're ever looking I mean they most they peel here for most products in general and it opens up go through that any questions always ask one of us here in the garden center I highly recommend you know going through the instructions of use with with one of us um, so insect disease 101 and so where are we today I mean do we have questions yes Yeah, it's not going to hurt. It's not going to hurt. Sometimes people don't like to because if you look at something like this, and if you were to take this leaf out, well, it's going to be, you know, aesthetically not pleasing. So, but it isn't anyways if it has a big brown spot on it. So I leave that up to the customer. Because that, I mean, will that leaf spot spread? It can. It can if conditions still persist, the favorable conditions. So yesterday, or, or the day before, I worked with a woman with the fig, and, or the ficus here, and she came in and, and she was willing to, to try a few things. You know, so we went over to the pharmacy over there in the garden center to look at all the chemicals and all the jazz, and we have a product in there, I think we've sold out of it now, um, it's called Revitalize. Now, you can use it on house plants, and it's a fungus disease control. You can use it as a soil drench, or you can use it as a soil, um, a, a topical foliar treatment. And I know that it can be discouraging because it's, you know, you invest in, um, and, you, and I have so many, well, what am I doing wrong? And it's not, again, it's not necessarily the customer, it's not necessarily you, it could be, it's not you, it's them, sort of thing. And um, I, I really just think it's the right plant for the right place. In the end, that's what it boils down to. Um, so do we have any of the, you know, I, we're talking about solutions, the potting soil, the insecticide, the trial and error, and um, other than that, you know, we talked about most common issues, the soils, um, any other, I should talk about fertilizing. That's what I should do. Um, so fertilizing houseplants, I recommend two products. Or two methods, is what I should say. Number one method I like to recommend is Osmocote. This is a synthetic, uh, uh, not organic or natural fertilizer. This is synthetic. It's pelletized. It's these little beads. And you basically fold the directions again on the back. You sprinkle some on the top soil, soil surface of your plant. Every time you water this plant, this, these pellets will break down and the plant will take up its nutrients as needed. The Osmocote is great because it's like set it and forget it and basically you only do it twice a year. It's a six month feed. Um, I, I like to pretend like this is a great reserve through the winter. During the winter, the houseplants are not, you know, most houseplants are not actively grown. Succulents grow during the winter, it seems, and they flower during the winter, it seems, too. But um, in general, it's, they're not actively growing, a lot of your foliage stuff. So just having a little bit of reserve, just a slow release uh, in case they need a little extra is probably, this is the product I recommend. You can also, so this is a big jug to use twice a year, um, but you can use this in your window boxes. You can use this in your perennial garden. Um, I use this in my window boxes plus miracle Grow. So... Um, I, I think that this has a great purpose in, in many different uses for the garden. So during actively growing periods for house plants, we like to recommend the Schultz plant food here. It's a liquid plant food, and you would put the drops in your watering can, according to the directions again. Um, every other time you feed during actively growing periods, so spring, summer, heading into the fall. But once you hit the fall, like... Again, at this period, they're not really growing, so slow it down as you head past Columbus Day. I feel like that's a good marker for a lot of things to kind of slow down a bit. So we like Schultz. Uh, we've been carrying this for years, but you can also use the miracle Grow all-purpose. This is just as good. Um, so either one of those. And then again, once you hit October, November, slow it down with some Osmocote. Maybe when you bring them inside, apply a little Osmocote. Maybe a little bit late, again, winter you know, heading into April or so, and then start with a regular liquid feed. 
Um, there are fertilizers specific to plants also, like, like the soils, there's violet fertilizers, there's succulent fertilizers. I mean, there's, there's a lot you can do. And, and, you know, it's not a bad idea to, to curtail your program to that type of plant and use the products that are out there. They're out there for a reason. So um, that's it for fertilizing. They, they don't need that much. You can do some, we carry in the store some lovely leaf shine, you know, in the home. They can look real dusty. We do it regularly here. We leaf shine all of our plants. It's tedious, but it's a good rainy day project. Um, I think that's, what, what time do we have here? Oh, it's only a half hour. Well, it leaves us a half hour with any types of questions or comments or anything like that. It's anything that you guys want me to go over specifically about other, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great way to, to gauge it. So there's a lot of ways you can check for watering. Um, this is bone dry. I can just look at the soil surface. It's chalky. But that's, look at how happy it is. I mean, I care less. This is a Dracaena. So these are some of my picks. We'll go through them in a sec. But this is, this is called the Dracaena kiwi. And if I take it out, I mean, it's, it's dust. It's fine. Nope. Nope, because again, in general, I would say houseplants like to be a bit root bound. Most of them come in root bound. Um, the growers have grown them like that. Nope. You can tell when a, when a plant needs to be repotted when the, the, the water is just gushing through. It doesn't, doesn't hold it. That, that soil's not holding any of the moisture. So when you see it just throw, flow through the pot, right into the saucer, okay. You have to give it a little bit more soil so it can retain some of that moisture. Um, other ways to check for water, yes, weight is a good one. Um, floor plants, I like to tell, instruct my customers, because the thing is, is let me see. So, you know, adequate drainage is really important for house plants. Um, without drainage, there's rot. So, what I like to do is, instruct my customers to stick their finger in there. It's soaked. It's so, I mean, not in a bad way, but it certainly doesn't need water. Um, if you find that, I mean, you know, it's clearly down at the roots. So if I feel the top, it's moist. I, I wouldn't even give it a second thought. I wouldn't water that. But if you find that, geez, it's real wet, don't be afraid to just take this plant out of the plastic and sit it on some newspapers for a few days in the home. Um, I, let it get some air. You know, you gotta think these, they're just kind of not suffocating in these plastic pots, but I, I would just pop it right out if you're having some watering issues. Um, a lot of people like to use, and myself included, like decorative pots that you're gonna find here at Home Goods, whatever, without any drainage. So in that case, we put the pot in the pot and it's a beautiful faux way without planting it um, to display in your home. You can plant it in a pot without drainage, but you're, ri you're, you're taking a risk and it's a high risk that you're probably gonna overwater. I, I would say with the exception of like succulents because you know that succulents they like to go dry in between waterings. They, now, don't get me wrong, we'll talk about succulents in a second, but um, you know, without drainage, you can, you can live without drainage, but just know that it's a 50-50. You have to be real careful, and if you happen to overwater once, well, now it's soaked. But if you do that, you know, don't panic, but you have to take it right out of that pot at home. Get it on some paper, some newspapers, and let it dry out before you put it back in. So it, this isn't a bad way to go about it, you know, putting it in, a, putting the pot in a pot without drainage but when you want to water it perhaps you can bring it to your bathtub or you can bring it to your sink and that might be tough for some people to bring a big floor plant into their bathtub and clog your drain in your bathtub so the other way is if you can what i do at home is i put a saucer in that pot that doesn't have drainage i put it at the bottom i'll still water it in there but let the water collect make sure you empty that water out uh, as soon as it's done drinking um, you know, I have, I have quite a few customers ask about, well, how do I know that I gave it enough? Um, I like to do a count kind of rule. Like all the mums out there, I count. I count to four seconds of watering every single mum that I water. 
So I like to do the same with house plants. I try to think of my measuring cup at home, like, okay, four cups, six cups, whatever. But if you just, let's pretend like a plant this size, you would probably give approximately four to five, four cups, four to five cups or so of water. But it's not a bad idea to start at three or two. And give it a drink and give it a minute. Let's see if it drains out. If it's drained through and you know it doesn't need to be repotted, you know, if it's drained through, well, to me, it's probably adequately, you know, watered. I, I mean, it's gone through. Um, if you still feel that there's some dry spots at the top, give it a little bit more. But once you see that water coming through, let it be. But it's always important to give it a second first is to hold the hose or whatever it is and stand there until you start seeing it. Just give it a minute to actually go through the plant. Um, yeah, any, any other, for the watering, did I cover that, you think? You know, the soil, the weight, the, the touch of the soil, feel the, you know, the under there. Yeah. Yes? When do you get rid of them? Or how? How? Um, so, w earlier we had just talked about um, maybe trying a preventative spray before, you mean insects, right? Hopefully no rodents are coming in. Right. Yeah. I think, me personally, if I, if I had a, a lot of plants, and, and if I didn't have any pets or kids or anything to worry about, I would consider doing a spray, a foliar spray of something. Perhaps you can do insecticidal soap over here or um, something a little bit stronger, a product called Eight. Uh, there's a variety of insecticides out there, but I would do it as a preventative before you bring them in. A good spray, nice even spray. If you want to take the step even further, I'm not a huge fan of, and I don't think it's a great idea to just treat broadcast spray and, and broadcast treat everything, but in, in that scenario, if you are used to having these issues every year, every time you bring them in, you know better, right? So I think if you did a spray as a preventative to begin with, um, and if you really wanted to go nuts, you could, I love this product, this is a systemic insect control. This is applied to the top one to two inches of your soil, and this will help prevent any eggs or larvae from, be, you know, from hatching or being laid. I love this. Fungus gnats is a big issue. I forgot to go over that. Fungus gnat are those little fruit fly looking guys that hover around your plants and they hop around the soil and stuff. Um, they're a real nuisance pest, um, and one way to help get rid of fungus gnats, which is very common in the home in the winter, is this systemic insect control. This will help prevent eggs from being laid or hatching. Um, I forgot to talk about these. They're not beautiful, but these are yellow sticky traps, just like flypaper. Use it. You can use it for a short period of time and then get rid of them in case it's aesthetically unpleasing in the home. I get it. So they just basically fold up. There are these little pieces of paper that fold up and it comes with a little stake and you stake it in, in and around your plants that would be infested. Um, the insects are attracted to the yellow color. So the adult flyers that you would see, like fungus gnat adults, um, Will or white fly even? What else? Fungus gnats and white flies. That's what it says. <laughs> um, they are attracted to that yellow. So any flyers will be drawn to it and stick to it. So that's a great way, a method of control to trapping those nuisance pests. I don't know if they would work on fruit flies. I'd like to try that myself. Um, I think a red, I think a, a, a apple cider vinegar works on fruit flies. Don't don't quote me, but. Um, this is, a, this is almost a great, I used to use these in college, uh, in the greenhouses, and they're indicator cards. They would let us know whether or not we have bugs. Uh, they also make blue ones for other types of insects, uh, thrips insects. So I, I do recommend, if you have an infestation, using some of these in the home for those nuisance flies. In combination with this, that should get a pretty good control. But um, you know, the one thing about fungus gnats is they like to breed in moist places. It goes back to watering, letting things dry out in between watering. So uh, if you can let that soil dry out of the plant, they don't have anywhere to breed. It goes back to keeping that soil nice and dry and water when it's dry, let it dry out, water when it's dry. Always allow at least a 50% of that soil to go dry. 
so. Uh, but I would. I would spray before you brought them in the home. You know, you can start with something mild like insecticidal soap, no harm, no foul, and just kind of see how it goes and take out the big guns. No, I think it's great if you did both. If you really want to go at it, if you know that you're going to have an issue because it's a, it's a regular thing for you, then go ahead. Yeah, I would do both because it's, it's two different methods of control. You're talking about a foliar spray, and so when the foliar sprays go, you know, on the leaves and the insects go after the leaves, well, they chew it or they, they a lot of your insects are piercing, sucking, so they stick their little sucker, uh, I don't even know, you know, into, they pierce and suck the leaf and then they pull out the chlorophyll. And that's why, you know, an indicator, if you have bugs, you might see yellow, stippling on the leaves, dots everywhere. Um, what that insect is doing is taking out the green, the chlorophyll, and then you see yellow. So, um, but I think it's great to do both. I think it, it should really give you a good method of control. Anything else? To have, yes. to move up? Yes. So if I was to buy this property yes. here, and the so you will know when to, well, if, okay, so if you want to, if you want to repot this right now and put it into a pretty decorative pot, I would repot it into the same size pot. This is a six inch pot. I would just go stick with this size. It's clearly happy. It's not bulging out. As it grows, you'll start to see more roots come to the surface. And as the roots come to the surface, they'll start to bulge out a bit. The plant may appear stressed. It might not take up water well again. And in that case, when you know, you want to move up about an inch and a half to two inches, or maybe an inch on each side, give or take, an inch to two. You know, you might think some plants are, are obviously faster growing than others. So if you know, like um, the Swiss cheese plant, I have one tucked over here. This one's called Monstera, and this is a fast grower. So if, you know, I mean, it doesn't need to be repotted right now. It's got plenty of room looking at the, the soil surface. It's clearly happy. But as it starts to bulge out of its pot a bit, um, I might go up a little bit more than just an inch on each side because, you know, knowing its growth habit, it might, it might take two months to get, you know, you're going to be buying pots five times a year. So, you know, getting to know the plant itself too. But generally about an inch, to, so an inch on each side should work. And again, I mean, <laughs> I have a lot of customers that will come in with, you know, a cutting of like a begonia or something, and they want to root it when they have a 10-gallon pot. And you, if you root that in there, I mean, it's never going to root because you water that 10-gallon pot, you know, well, I'm exaggerating, but a 2-gallon with just one little cutting is way too much soil, way too much soil surface and too much water. It'll never take. If it does, I'd be surprised. <laughs> Um, and so, do you guys want to go over a couple of my favorite picks? Okay. So, hey Jake. So, um, I'm going to start with, first I'm going to start with our plant of the month. So, Weston Nurseries, because of the beautiful new greenhouse that we have here, um, we're trying something a little bit different between our Hockington and Chelmsford stores. Uh, myself and the buyer up there have come up with a plant of the month we would like to try. I mean, it catches on a little bit, but this one is called Pilea, Pilea, or Pilea, however you want to pronounce it, Peperomioides is the Latin. Um, and it's all over the internet, along with the ficus fig over there. Um, and it's, it's the most trendy plant out there right now. It's a shareable plant, so it creates these little babies. And people are really having a lot of fun with it and dividing it and taking little babies and passing it on to their friends. So it's real hip, real cool. It's a medium to low light growing plant. It, it doesn't want full sun, so um, kind of probably get to be about six to eight inches or so. I've seen it maybe even closer to 12. And so it just takes some time to really fill out, but you can see the little babies are coming and I just wanted to highlight it because it's adorable. Um, we have them on special right now for $9.50. They're, they're not a, a cheap plant, but they're definitely, I would say a beginner plant. Um, it's got a real succulent type, succulent type foliage. So therefore, 
when something has that type of foliage, it holds a lot of its own water. It doesn't require tons of, of water. Um, so I think that, um, yeah, it says it grows best, best in indirect light, bright indirect light, keeps soil lightly moist, allow for good drainage. Again, drainage is really important. So pilea is a great one. And, and next to the pilea, um, this is probably my pick. I have three types just right here. And this, this is called Peperomia. There is hundreds of species of Peperomia plants. I swear you can't kill them. Um, that's why I like them. They come in all sorts of, of varieties of colors. Um, this one's called Ripple Peperomia. The, who is this? This one is, it's just a generic Peperomia tag. So medium bright light i mean full sun i wouldn't say but they they again they have more succulent leaves i like to think i like plants that you know it's sink or swim not everybody has time to uh cater to these little guys all day and if you do wonderful um so this is probably my fam my favorite family of plants is peperomia i think it's safe to say just going sticking in with the succulent line of plants this is another great one called ZZ plant. Real trendy also. A lot of college kids like the look of these. They like the look of these. Um, they can put them on their windowsills and stuff. I, if, I'm going to pass this around because um, it's very drought resistant because of its foliage and such, but loves to be pot bound. And I, I really, I seriously want to pass this to you. So I'm going to. <laughs> because you have to feel how tight that is in the pot. Like yeah. just what you see at the mall. Yeah. They're always people are things. kicking it and throwing their sodas in it and I mean you know I'm, you know I just want you to feel so you can see like the bulbs down here that it creates and grows. I, it's just one of the easiest plants to grow uh, air purifying um, cool plant, ZZ plant. So you don't yeah, you can just pop it on the ground when you're done. Um, so we're big fans of ZZ plant around here. When someone comes in and says, I need something I can't kill, that's my number one. That's what I go to. Um, so the other plant that we actually have up front displayed with the pilea is called Dracaena. I'm going to skip this one for a moment. These are Dracaena. So the family of Dracaena, again, are it's huge. There's hundreds of species. And I mean, completely different looking. Night and day. One of my favorite families also. Just real easy to grow. Um, they are susceptible to a couple pests. I'd say mealybug is probably the number one pest of Dracaena. They kind of get into the little crevices of the, of the, corn, of the cane here. Um, but again, you water when they're dry. They don't want to be bone dry for too long, but they don't want to be wet. Just nice tropical looking foliage, just some up front there, nice, um, there's some other varieties that are just straight green, some have white stripes. I mean, some people are really into the exotic look of them all, and, and some just want a basic, you know, just clean green looking plant. Um, these are also, actually, all of our Dracaena are on special too right now for $14.50. There's a variety of them up front, something for everyone. So, you know, I would say that they play well in the sandbox with most other foliage plants. Um, I wouldn't pair. That's one thing to think about if you're going to do a, a, a grouping of plants, if you're going to make a big pot of, of an arrangement, is you know who's going to play well together. I wouldn't necessarily put a ZZ plant or a Peperomia, um, well, maybe, with the Dracaena. The thing is, is you know, less water, probably a little bit more than this. So it's just finding that fine line. Like when you create a succulent dish garden, you really, you know, you want to keep within that line if you can, cactus, succulent, keep them together uh, so that the watering habits and requirements are the same. So just keep that in mind when creating a, a you know, a, a multi-garden there. Um, this is beautiful. This is called Calathea, or Calathea, some people say. Um, Similar to a prayer plant, it has the same sort of look, if you guys are all familiar with that. They are gorgeous. They come in all types of colors. There's, we have some on the table over there that have beautiful white foliage. These are ones that they actually do pretty well in fluorescent lighting, artificial lighting. A lot of people in the offices like these. Um, 
again, the watering, just water when it's dry. Um, allow it to dry out, but you know, not to a crispy state. Um, but for me, I love these so much just because of the colors and the texture. And I mean, if you look at the undersides of some of these, we have a variety over there called Calathea lancifolia. And its leaves, like lanceolate, are, are narrow and skinny, but they, they at night, go, they, they turn up and in the morning and they'll relax, like they, they let down. So it's just, it's just cool, little funny characteristics. You get to know them. <laughs> um, and finally, I would say, you know, you would probably see these in the magazines everywhere, next to the fig or the ficus, however you want to say. This is a Chinese evergreen, two types. We have about four or five types, again, hundreds of species. These are very common uh, uh, families up here. This is um, Chinese evergreen, uh, Aglaonema is its Latin name, and they come also in a variety of colors and variegations. They are so easy to grow. I pair them right, right next to the Dracaena. I'd say out of this grouping here, probably the Calathea could be a little bit tri more tricky than all the others, if, but I, I'd say that the Aglaonema is hands down you can't kill it sort of plant. Um, this is behind me. All of these are aglaonemas, all these floor plants. I mean, just set it, forget it, water it when it's dry. That's it. So great family of plant, plants to choose from. Um, you can see they come in pinks and stuff. And most of them probably on average about 24 to maybe 36 inches at best. I've seen, I haven't seen them bigger than that. I could be wrong. They could easily grow bigger. I just I haven't seen them larger than that. Um, you know, the Dracaena family here, we, you get them, you know, five to six to eight feet tall. This here is a Dracaena down at the end. So again, just so many varieties of this family and, and other families. Um, down in the front table over here to my left and to my right, I've just, they're just two small sections of air purifying tables. All plants, large leaf plants in general, help purify the air. They all take in those toxins, um, but highlighted in a lot of places are the peace lily, the spider plant. Um, you can see, uh, see clearly the marketing out there for the crispy wave fern at the edge there. Um, so a lot of people are looking for that, that sort of thing in their home. And, and most plants will do that. Aglaonema is a great one for that. Snake plant over here, down to the front right, we need a bit, we're getting a bigger selection soon, but that's great, that's on the list. And have you all had a snake plant? You really can't kill that. I mean. Wow. See, it's just as good as silk. So, I mean, you really, it's tough as nails. It is so tough. So, so tough. And if that goes bone dry, forget it. It loves it. Let it go dry. It doesn't care. I mean, so if you really are looking for something that you don't even want to think about, just get a snake plant. I don't know. I, you know, the light conditions on a snake plant, whatever. <laughs> it's so. Mother in law's tongue, I know. Yes. Um, so some people come in with, with that common name also. I have a customer who has, I think she said she has something like 16 varieties of snake plant. I didn't even know there was that many, but apparently there are. So that's, uh, I would like to offer that soon for a plant of the month here. It's, it's, it's a great plant to have, everyone should have one. Yeah, fit in small spaces. And so that's something to consider when purchasing small, medium, or large stuff, you know, is it going to fit in the space? Obviously that fig, these figs will get to be 10 to 12 feet. They'll get big if they're happy. Trying to get them happy is the question of the day, but um, yeah, again, right, for, right plant for the right place. So anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, that's a good question. We have that all the time. There, if you go to the ASPCA on, online, to the ASPCA, ASPCA, it's, um, I don't know what it actually is, it's the animal, MSPCA, thank you, MSPCA, yes. They will give you a list of um, safe plants, toxic versus non-toxic plants for your pets. 
I don't, there's a, there's a few varieties out there. I know palms in general are relatively safe for cats and dogs. Um, I feel like some varieties of ferns, Boston ferns, but it's definitely a challenge for a lot of people. Most things have harmful toxins in them. The question becomes, and what I've, what I've read is, how harmful is the toxin? At what, how much consumption, how much do they need to really consume to get ill? Um, and what does that, what does a toxin, what types of things does it cause? It might cause uh, mouth irritation, nose irritation, it could cause vomiting, it could cause other things that are pretty severe, could cause depression, I've read, in animals. So um, it's important that if you, you have questions or concerns that you do your research, maybe contact your vet. Um, I, we don't like to generally you know, recommend too many things because everyone's different. It's just like, you know, kids, they have allergies and uh, you don't know. For, for children, I don't really, I don't like to really address that much with my customers. I just contact their local, their pediatrician, of course, because I don't want to make a recommendation. You know, someone could just have a, an adverse reaction. So there's tons of lists online. It's just, it's a matter of more for me, the individual pet or, or child that we're talking about. So, and, and some pets will just graze, cats graze regularly on all types of plants and they have no effects at all. Um, sometimes they just chew and spit it out. So, depends on the cat too. Yeah, and some will just eat the whole thing and nothing will happen, it'll be fine. Like poinsettias, you know, every, poinsettias are poisonous. They are poisonous. You have to eat, I feel like, a fair amount, just like chocolate, but if, if we're talking about a little dog or a little cat, um, that, that could mean minimal, so. Always consult your vet or your pediatrician. We don't, we don't, we don't cross the, those boundaries here. <laughs> yeah. um, anything else? Did we cover all the bases? Did you guys get some good info out of this? Or, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Well, it's funny you said that because I mean one of the the most commonly common problems of the ficus plant um, is not necessarily this ficus, but do I have one behind me? I don't have one behind me. Um, is they don't like to be moved. They don't like to be moved. If they move, they go into shock. They shed their leaves. So there are certain types of plants that really, if you find the right place, let it be. Just let it be. It's happy in its home. Um, trying to get gardenias and other house plants to bloom. When doing that, just so you know, think about what you do outside in the garden to get things to bloom. Generally, you want to use a relatively high phosphorus fertilizer, like a bloom booster. I don't have it up here. I probably should. Um, but bloom boosters, it's a high phosphorus content, and that pr basically promotes root growth. And, and then therefore increases bloom, bloom power. So if you're trying to get something to bloom like that, look for a bloom booster fertilizer and, and you should be good. Um, you know, gardenias in general, they like acidic fertilizer. So I recommend mere acid for them, maybe plus a bloom booster. So it's just getting to know your plants and that's why we're here. Um, you know, any questions or anything, you can always feel free to call the nursery. I gave you guys my business card. If you want to call me direct, that's fine. I, I, you can email me pictures. I get pictures all the time and just troubleshoot. But, you know, don't give up if, if you don't have something. I, I mean, I, I spent a lot of money in college getting my degree in this and I have plants die at home regularly. I know what I'm doing. I just, it's, uh, maybe I'm not picking the right plant for the right place all the time because you really want to force the subject sometimes because you believe that, well, that, I just, that's what I need there. Well, it'll tell you whether or not it wants to be there. Um, so don't give up. Keep trying. That's it. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. It was wonderful being here this morning when it was so chilly out and so warm in the greenhouse, and I hope you get a lot of great tips to help keep your house plants going over the winter months.